we want to welcome um, Nancy Spanos. She's a very, a very dear member of the Hamiltonian community and um, an extraordinary author and researcher as well. Spanos has studied Alexander Hamilton since the 1970s. And um, she has authored two books dealing with uh, Alexander Hamilton's economic thinking, The Political Economy of the American Revolution, which was, um, and also Alexander Hamilton versus Wall Street, The Core Principles of the American System of Economics. She also blogs on Hamilton and related themes at americansystemnow.com. Um, we would like to welcome Nancy. Thank you so much for coming here. And before you start your presentation, I would like to ask you for, for everybody to get to know you a little better. How did you get started with Alexander Hamilton? How did he first cross your path? Well, you didn't mention the time that that first book was written. Um, very early, the middle of the 1970s, uh, which is when I discovered Alexander Hamilton. I was, I was, didn't have a background in economics, but I was very concerned with what was going on politically and economically at the time. And I decided to look at American history. And the uh, I happened um, in reading Hamilton to read the report on manufacturers and that totally changed my idea of what economics was uh, in the American system. And it has been with me ever since. So the particular element of that had to do, now I had taken economics 101 in college, you know, uh, but, uh, and it was the dismal science, right? Of, terrible choices of what are you going to do and, and how do you get the most out of people and so forth. But Hamilton was talking about the ability to, uh, that economics had to do with stimulating human thought and creativity in building things. And that just uh, meant that I had to look at him more. And I did. And it was a vision so powerful that even today, several um, decades after you wrote your first book, you're still um, completely, completely caught with uh, all the, the thoughts and the uh, system that you saw that Hamilton put in place. Um, I have a following question to the first one that I asked. Um, after getting to know Hamilton and his vision and studying his um, report on manufacturers, how much did all that new knowledge change your perception of the world that you live in? How much do you attribute to the genius of Hamilton? Well, uh, to be frank, I, I didn't see us living up to that as well as I thought we might. <laughs> um, you know, it was a transition time, the 1970s, in terms of manufacturing and uh, investment and in infrastructure and doing the kinds of, of develop, optimistic development that was being that he was discussing in the 1790s. So I tended to look at it more from the standpoint of, as we have to do with a lot of American history, I believe as a standard to look up to uh, or to adapt and figure out how to to look at the principles there, not necessarily all the particulars, but the principles and how they could inform our activity today. Um, so I constantly am finding elements of that report and, and the banking reports as well. Um, I didn't totally shy away from those, <laughs> but uh, having incredible relevance to what we uh, should be doing and what we did in certain periods of our history. And, uh, and I have been fortunate enough to work with other people, some of whom have pointed out the enormous influence Hamilton had on follow-up thinkers, some of which I will be discussing today and all around the world, not just here. 
In fact, I think there was just an article about, you know, you're all aware that the, the uh, countries of Africa are less enthralled with Queen Elizabeth II than many other uh, heads of state around the world. And, uh, you know, this was an article that said many of them are looking to or look to the idea of developing themselves as manufacturing countries and tend to look at a Hamiltonian perspective. Um, it's interesting, even today. Absolutely. And thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, once again, uh, on behalf of the Alexander Hamilton Awareness Society, we would like to welcome everyone who is present. And um, um, Nancy, take it away. I chose to speak about the report on manufacturers because I consider that to be the major source of wealth on Hamilton's thinking. Um, and one of the most important documents that ever came out of the United States as a state paper. Uh, the, its influence was absolutely enormous. Let me see if I can get to the next. Screen. It's not moving forward. Oh, here we go. I'm going to go with three parts. Um, the first, the leading ideas in the document, then their role in building the United States, and then their international influence. Um, the first being that the leading ideas. I don't know why this is not working quite the way it should, but so. I'm looking for that little. Okay. So the report, as probably many of you are aware, was the last of the major ones. It was prepared over, it was commissioned very early in 1790 and was produced basically at uh, almost two years later. Uh, there was tremendous research done by Hamilton and his treasury department to discover the state of manufacturers. And it, uh, but, and it, was a comprehensive document with a major theoretical section, uh, major argumentation on the arguments that were made against manufacturing and a very specific outline of measures which he thought should be taken in order to put the United States on the right path. Uh, the report has tended to be underappreciated uh, and under discussed, I believe, maybe until the last few years uh, when it's become a little bit more in vogue. But it is a, that is, I believe, not only because of its length and the fact it was never voted on in Congress and hardly discussed in that venue, because there was great opposition to it at the time. Um, and uh, that opposition had an enormous effect. So we want to look at, however, what impact it did have, because despite the fact it was never voted on in Congress, adopted as official policy, um, it has had this major intellectual and physical import uh, throughout the entire um, through the history since. Now, what many people don't realize or acknowledge is that that report actually begins with a attack on Adam Smith, not by name, uh, it wasn't polite to do it in those days, but Hamilton says right up front, well, it seems obvious to us that given the shortages we had in the last war and all the problems we had that we should have a manufacturing base, 
but it doesn't seem obvious to some respectable uh, economists around the world. And then he quotes their arguments against the uh, having a, a nation such as the United States, uh, a relatively small nation without a very large population, without a considerable amount of capital, why they should venture into manufacturing. Uh, and he is in good, uh, he's right on uh, because Adam Smith had specifically in the Wealth of Nations attacked the idea of the United States devoting any efforts into developing its manufacturing. Uh, and this, he, it was almost like a threat, you know, were the Americans to stop importing our manufacturers and start giving privileges, monopolies to their own people, they would obstruct instead of promote the progress of their country toward real wealth and greatness. Now, Hamilton uh, was quite aware that this was not true. <laughs> Um, certainly, he was aware that the British themselves had done a lot with giving monopolies to their own countrymen and other kinds of things to develop their own manufacturers. So uh, he decided that he should take on this uh, respectable opinion, uh, which he does at, in, at very great length. And I won't obviously go through all of that, but I recommend it to all of you. Now, his conclusion is directly the opposite. Uh, that if we continue to need to bring our commodities, our manufactured goods from Europe, uh, and we have to rely on their market for what we are producing, which was a very inconsistent kind of thing, then uh, we will be them, I have the them in the wrong place, the United States will be impoverished compared to what we actually should have given our political and uh, physical situation in the world. I mean, we are actually in a better position to be more prosperous than many countries in the world. So the, um, that is, uh, he knew that Smith was not telling the truth uh, and he was deterred, but he was determined and very polite, uh, very exhaustive language to indicate that this was, uh, that we had to go in the opposite direction. He also knew that Smith had a, audience here in these, this country, which had to be taken after, gone after. Now, the, uh, there was, of course, the fundamental idea was that we needed to have manufacturers in order to secure our economic independence. If you are dependent upon foreign nations in order to ensure that you survive day to day, that you have your uh, the kind of quality of life that is connected with improving your population, not to mention your, your defense, um, then you are not really independent, despite the fact that you waged a war of eight years in order to get so. So the function of becoming a manufacturing nation Hamilton asserts is that we, it provides for the independence and security of our country. And from his study, he said, uh, every country which has those qualities is, has developed its manufacture. And every nation, he said, should have, be able to supply the essentials, the subsistence, habitation, clothing, and defense. Uh, and I would view today, certainly, and I believe 
it was justifiable to do at that time, defense in a very broad sense, not simply the military. Now, the, he also had to take on the idea that encouraging manufacturers was going to be a detriment to the agricultural sector. Uh, this is something that the British, you may recall way back in um, the time in 1774 was actually uh, playing on the difference between the farming interest and the, and the mercantile interest in the farmer that uh, Hamilton dealt with and the farmer refuted saying, you know, it's just one section of the population wants to get rich at the expense of you farmers. Uh, he said, no, this is, is not the case. Um, it is what is the case is that if you develop new manufacturers, you actually both improve your agriculture and you improve the prosperity of your country as a whole. Uh, which is what is absolutely critical uh, to the to your survival and your prosperity as a nation. Now, part of that development, which I just sort of reacquainted myself with in reviewing for this talk, um, was the degree to which Hamilton discusses there the need to develop the domestic market which is something which is very important to the agricultural sector, for example, because if they, instead of relying on an undependable market in, for grain, for example, or for, for cotton even, uh, in Europe, where they could get it from somewhere else or their harvest meant that they didn't have to import so much, if there was, sufficient domestic demand, you, they wouldn't have to uh, rely on the conditions that were set down uh, internationally in that market. So Hamilton emphasizes the need to develop a domestic market, which means a diverse economy, you know, one that connects the agricultural development with the industrial development. Uh, providing a market for surplus uh, uh, produce, a reliable market, uh, and a growing market, as long as your industry is developing. Now, in the course of these somewhat practical sounding uh, measures that I'm discussing, Hamilton, of course, is dealing with more fundamental questions on what is wealth, right? What does produce wealth? Um, and on, I, on the question, initial question of whether it's just your agriculture, if the product of the soil is the only thing that is really productive, um, he actually follows very closely on Adam Smith in taking on the physiocratic school uh, and says this is you know, goes through all the questions of land rent and, and consumption and so forth that uh, make up that argument saying it's definitely not the case. Um, but so if agriculture is not, uh, and land per se is not your main source of wealth, well, another main source of wealth that uh, was considered at the time was getting wealthy through trade by cheap sell deer, right? Accumulate a lot in your coffers that way. Uh, but that was not the way that Hamilton, in my view, that Hamilton saw wealth uh, being accumulated as well. Throughout the entire report on manufacturers, his emphasis, he keeps coming back to the fact that what you want to develop is your productive powers of labor through increased mechanization through increased uh, development of machinery that will improve the uh, your output and your ability to expand further. You, you're, you will increase, uh, your improve the machine, even as, you know, as essentially talking about a machine tool industry, 
uh, way back then. Uh, and this mechanization will aid your agriculture, it will aid uh, your output per person, it will aid uh, your capability of producing more in the future. And it's from that standpoint that Hamilton gets into the what was my quote that captivated me uh, as to the unique uh, nature of economic thinking uh, versus what I'd been taught, at least up to uh, the middle of the 1970s. And that is in his discussion of the benefits of manufacturing, his putting forward that it cherishes and stimulates the activity of the human mind. Surely this is what's behind the need to, uh, the ability to develop your mechanization, to improve your productivity, to have technological progress. You can't have that with a system which basically doesn't educate people, which puts them uh, in the position of, of slaves, um, which doesn't provide them with any leisure to read and so forth and so on. So this is, um, in fact, I think from this concept, uh, it supports the fact and from studies that I've done on, on Virginia and other places, of why the federalist side, and I wouldn't totally equate Hamilton and federalism, but you know, to the extent, uh, but there is some very close parallels most of the time for a while. Uh, the federalists were more open to education because this is necessary in order to have a productive economy. So those are some of the highlights of those uh, ideas of the need for developing manufacturing. Um, the, he also gets into the fact that you will need to have improvements in your transport to support the improvement of your manufacturing base. Um, this is obviously not a very improved road, but he does say that this shouldn't necessarily be state by state. If he, we could very well use a comprehensive plan in order to uh, have the states work together to improve transportation. And where did he think he did have to address the question of where the authority to do this manufacturing promotion could come from? Because of course, there were those who believed that the constitution did not permit it. Um, and this is a quote from the report on manufacturers, which addresses that question. Um, he relies on the general welfare clause, which as you know, is not only in the preamble, but also in the uh, powers of the Congress. And he interprets it liberally um, that what, it, and as long as the interests are general of learning, agriculture, manufacturers, commerce. I mean, consider he's talking about learning. This is, this is our treasury secretary, right? <laughs> uh, not just talking about making money. Um, he's talking about developing productive power. Um, and he sees the constitutional authority for that very much in the constitution, which of course he had uh, more than most people think to do with putting together. Um, and he also addresses, and I'm not gonna go into this, the financial architecture aspect of what he did, which is obviously integrally important to be being able to carry out the manufacturing plan, but it's not my subject tonight. Um, there are experts on the line that we could talk about that, but, but he does, raised the, his development of the first bank of the United States as an answer to the question, well, there's just not enough capital in the United States to develop manufacturing. Uh, and he said, well, number one, he goes through a long discussion of why foreign capital, it would be useful to 
bring into the United States in order to, uh, if it's used to increase the productivity of the land, manufacturing establishments and canals, infrastructure and so forth. And secondly, uh, he raises the fact that we have the Bank of the United States, which will allow us to use government credit to provide to our entrepreneurs in order to uh, invest. So that is not in a neat form, but I think I've covered pretty much the some of the crucial ideas in the report of manufacturers. Now, how were they put to work in building the US economy? Uh, there was only so much Hamilton could do uh, in his years up to 1796. Uh, he was, as you know, uh, constantly embattled uh, from the Jeffersonians and he had very, uh, and he had to bring the nation out of bankruptcy uh, and create a financial system and do all the things that were prerequisite to moving into the manufacturing area. But as we know, um, he did do something very significant in around the same time as doing the report on manufacturers by establishing the SEUM, um, and I'm not gonna talk a lot about that because I see that Leonard Zacks is on the line and he's gave a presentation on this back in 2017, but I, maybe he'll, uh, maybe he's done one since then. That's the one I saw. Uh, but this was a very important pilot project for the kind of, development which Hamilton saw was necessary. And uh, it developed into the city of Patterson, a very successful commercial and industrial site over the course of more than uh, a century. Uh, although many people downplay it um, after a rocky start, it really by the beginning of the 19th century, uh, it began to make major contributions uh, to the country. And this is uh, something Hamilton put himself forward to write the prospectus for, to help recruit the workers for, uh, get the organization going uh, in order to uh, show what can be done. Not a, it wasn't a mill town like the New England towns. It was to be a multi-industrial site. Uh, which would show what the United States could do. Um, he was also able to uh, implement the tariff portions, the proposed, some of the proposals, the concrete proposals that he made at the conclusion of the uh, report on manufacturers. Uh, the key one, I, I guess what I've read is that within five months, all of his specific proposals for raising tariffs uh, were actually put into effect. The top priority being the iron industry, uh, which is what uh, he had done. And by the way, the first uh, tariff bill, which was passed in the United States, was passed... <laughs> Um, on July 4th, 1789, prior to Hamilton becoming Treasury Secretary, and was explicitly devoted not just to raising revenue for the bankrupt government, but also for protecting domestic manufacturers, which had developed during the war. Uh, so that was one of the very first, I think, believe that was the first act of the, uh, passed by the Congress. Um, that created, uh, was done in the direction that Hamilton began to elaborate in the report. He also did begin uh, some rudimentary infrastructure projects. Uh, he was involved in discussing many others, uh, including up toward the Erie Canal, but 
uh, the major one that was done was uh, that he began and was head of was the uh, system of lighthouses, 12 lighthouses on the coast. Uh, and there were 12 that, that uh, were taken over by the federal government or were supposed to be until the states finally agreed. Um, and the and four that were under construction. One that was under construction was uh, at Fort, uh, Port Henry in Virginia, which was called Hamilton's Light because <laughs> he was involved with it. And this is the one at Portland Headlight, which I like because that's where I was born. So, um, but uh, so that's why I have this one instead of the other. But but these were. These were prototypical of the kind of thinking that Hamilton and Washington had about providing uh, for the necessities of, uh, of building the nation and our commerce and the safety of the seamen. Uh, these did not charge the ships or the individuals who needed to be rescued and taken care of. It was all paid by the federal government. In fact, there's letter after letter discussing the personnel between Washington and Hamilton. But uh, this was considered a, a very important public, it's our first public infrastructure project, uh, which is uh, something I think worth thinking about today. Now, as I said, he left office without having been able to do all that much uh, in terms directly in terms of the manufacturing uh, thrust and the ideas in the report. Um, there actually, I forgot to mention one other thing that he put at the end of the uh, report on manufacturers, he actually anticipates that from the measures that are taken there, there will be a surplus in the US government and that they we will be able to use that for to establish a board to promote arts, agriculture, manufacturers, and commerce. Sort of, as I see it, like a National Academy of Sciences or something of that sort that would um, be a federal think tank. <laughs> As you, as you might say, uh, for what kind of innovations would need to be made in order to improve the economy. So that, you know, that didn't happen uh, for sure um, as we entered the Jeffersonian era. But there was a continuation of the fight for Hamilton's ideas for manufacturers, for the National Bank and associated ideas directly up to the time of Abraham Lincoln. Um, and as I, as I moved ahead a little bit too quick. So you first have Matthew Carey, then you have his son, Henry C. Carey, and then uh, Abraham Lincoln, direct one. Carey, uh, an Irish immigrant, uh, is there in the beginning. Uh, he is the first to publish, uh, according to the uh, statutes and stories, and I think others, that to do the complete report of manufacturers in his magazine, the American Museum. He did a lot of other uh, early uh, publications as well. And, um, and he was a fighter. Uh, he, was a he was a Democratic Republican on the political side, but he was convinced that Hamilton's ideas for developing manufacturers and using the federal government to support, to support them with credit and with legislation was absolutely essential. And he kept up that fight for uh, from 17, late 1788, when I believe, or 87, when he founded the American Museum, all the way until his death. Uh, example of his, he had tremendous more influence after the War of 1812 because he had predicted that that would be a disaster if the Bank of the United States was eliminated. 
And he was correct and he wrote a pamphlet and it was very widely read and considered. So, uh, and then he just, so after that, he really started organizing up a storm and from Philadelphia and Pennsylvania where he was. Uh, he established a, uh, he campaigned for a new national bank. He campaigned for industry. He established this society for the promotion of national industry. He campaigned for higher tariffs uh, he, and he campaigned for canals and national infrastructure, all of which he saw as a continuation of the ideas of Hamilton in the report on manufacturers. And he said that in particular, um, these are some quotes from his essays at the time, uh, which he turned into a book on national economy. Um, he was convinced that uh, Hamilton had the political economy that the country, the only political economy that would allow the country to thrive, um, that uh, people had to understand it, that industry was absolutely essential to that prosperity and natural, national virtue. And he went so far as to reprint a huge section uh, arguing for manufacturers from the report on manufacturers uh, in his uh, voluminous writing. He's, his, his day job was as a publisher. So he uh, printed a lot of, of documents, not just and books, not just his own, but he publicized Hamilton throughout as the standard uh, and as having the ideas and specifically in the report of manufacturers, which were required. He was aided, there's a whole crew of people here that are, that I wanna mention quickly uh, by Nicholas Biddle, who became the head of the, the successful head of the second bag of the United States. Uh, this is a quote from the, uh, from the bank war, but um, it's, he was absolutely critical to putting into action uh, some of Hamilton's um, ideas for development. Uh, they were joined by Henry Clay. Uh, he, people used obvious, often think of him as just fighting for the tariff. I don't believe that's at all what he was doing. He was fighting for American manufacturers. Um, and that included the national banking system, a, a national bank. Uh, it included federal support for infrastructure, the kinds of things that Hamilton had in the report. And then John Quincy Adams. Now, of course, John Quincy Adams would have dropped dead if he said he was doing something for Alexander Hamilton because the families, he, he hated that, uh, Hamilton because of his attacks on his father. But what he did as president followed very much in the line of what Hamilton had laid out uh, needed to be done, the development of the use of the national banking system to promote industry in the infrastructure, the uh, use of the uh, looking for federal support for science uh, and protection of industry through the tariff and so forth. It was under Quincy Adams that the second national bank uh, that the Congress was gotten to vote, allow the second national bank uh, to purchase stock in canal companies, which began to uh, populate and, and vastly improve the productivity of the US economy in the middle of the 19, uh, in the 1820s. Uh, this was a very big improvement. And then when his, a father left the scene, Henry C. Carey took up the Hamiltonian cause. And I see I'm taking a long time, so I'll have to move quickly. But he too specifically pegged himself to Hamilton. Um, and he played a crucial role in educating and electing Lincoln, who carried 
and he was emphasized the need to raise the standard of labor, i.e. invest in your standard of living, which meant your infrastructure, it meant your uh, manufacturing capability, as well as your wages. And this proceeded willy-nilly under Lincoln. Uh, the, the Department of Agriculture, which was uh, effectively a way of spreading uh, scientific knowledge of, of education uh, to help the farmer and our productivity as an agricultural innovation. Uh, the Pacific Railroad, uh, funded, as you know, by a huge amount of government land and bonds. The uh, education of not only farmers, uh, but others through the land bank uh, college uh, system done in 1862. And of course, the national banking system, uh, which while not a national bank, uh, took from Hamilton to the extent of using the requiring the purchase of federal uh, treasury bonds in order to issue currency. So, and essentially finally establishing one currency uh, in the way that Hamilton succeeded temporarily in doing that with the first national bank uh, and then was done for a time with the second national bank. Um, this is, this is the first time Hamilton appears on a bill. <laughs> um, and I just want to cite here uh, a quote, if I may, uh, from, uh, from Dick Silla's uh, major book uh, a few years ago on Hamilton, the, the illustrated biography, where, which is what I would conclude with on this, where he said, the state which Hamilton planned and imagined, Abraham Lincoln completed and confirmed. I think that's true. Now, quickly the international influence because all of this, you know, Hamilton was not simply a domestic figure. Uh, the report on manufacturers was immediately spread to Europe. It was partly of that was as a recruiting instrument to try to bring uh, skilled workers to the United States to help uh, educate us and uh, improve our productivity. Um, the bring plans that uh, were otherwise under seal. Um, I know at least a thousand copies were circulated around in Ireland to try to recruit. But more interesting, uh, perhaps more interesting in a way, is that the Russian uh, charged the fair in London immediately asked the US consul if he could get a copy. And by 1807, it was translated into Russian. Uh, now I've looked around, it doesn't appear to have been translated into uh, other European countries in the near term, but that's as far as I can tell. Uh, Certain, but it certainly had in, there had impact, and the major sources of impact were number one, Friedrich List, who uh, was here working with Matthew Carey in the 1820s, and wrote extensively on the American system of economy. Continued uh, the attack theoretically and practically on Adam Smith's approach, uh, where because it wasn't just the United States that was kept in a subservient relationship to uh, Britain uh, in terms of manufacturers, but Germany and, and Russia and many other places as well, not to mention India. Um, so he went back to Europe in the 30s. He lived to the, till I think the late 40s, but he was one of the most popular economists in the entire world. His work was translated into Asian languages. It was translated by Vita into Russian. And, uh, and it spread the American system. It spread Hamilton uh, throughout the world. 
uh, this, you know, his point there was, well, again, the productive power of labor, that what you want to establish with your economic system is not simply accumulating species or land or uh, goods, but to uh, get productive power, to be able to reproduce yourself, to be able to uh, become uh, increasingly powerful in your productive capability. And then Japan, uh, as early as the 1860s, the Japanese had sent people over here to uh, to look into what Lincoln was doing. Finally, it looked like the United States was going to make it. Um, and they he viewed the uh, measures that were taken later with the Meiji Restoration against feudalism in Japan as taking from the American, from Hamiltonian ideas. Uh, and under the Grant administration, briefly, um, we actually proselytized Hamiltonian ideas in Asia uh, with uh, Grant sent this guy, Peshon Smith, over there to uh, Japan, where he sat in the US consul, wrote articles for the Japanese papers and promoted national bank and promoted uh, federal support for infrastructure um, and uh, developing advanced manufacturing. And the consequence of this spread of Hamiltonian ideas I think can be seen by what had happened by the end of the 20th of the 19th century, which is where Great Britain had been at the top of uh, productivity. The, by the end of that time, all the nations which had studied and begun to implement uh, Hamiltonian ideas had come out on top. Now, what happened in the next century, us having established ourselves to this industrial nation, is beyond the scope of this talk. Um, the, but we had established that the benefits and the success of Hamiltonian measures, such as investment in technological progress, government support and protection for industry, sovereign credit, the government backed and regulated credit system and modernizing infrastructure. Those had been successful uh, in building uh, our country and had put other countries on the way as well. And that was, and we, for that, we can give the credit to Alexander Hamilton. And that's what I have. Excellent. Thank you so much, Nancy. Uh, we're looking for uh, people to start sharing their questions so we can uh, address them. There is a question here. Did Hamilton address workers' wages? Hamilton did not. Oh, well, yes, in, in once in one way. Um, the question came up in the report of manufacturers that workers were too expensive in the United States. And there, that was another reason we couldn't have manufacturing here. You know, you had to pay because we had fewer workers, a lesser population than Europe. You know, they could command more, uh, more wages and so forth. He said, uh, on the one hand, I don't think the difference is as big as as you say. But he said, on the other hand, we can deal with that by increased. Uh, technological progress, increased mechanization. So he 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 declined to say we should keep the wages down. Um, Carey, Matthew Carey, uh, did extensive uh, uh, writing on the question of the wage of defending workers' wages, um, and he, as I said, he saw himself as a 
as a disciple, one would almost say, of Alexander Hamilton. Thank you. Uh, how much of an influence did Hamilton's view of the need to improve national defense and, and security, um, how much of an influence did that have to do, in your opinion, with uh, his vision on manufacturers? Well, I, it was definitely part of it. Um, the, the initial commission involved uh, being able to prepare for defense, and certainly he was very acutely aware of the lack of that during the Revolutionary War. So I think it had a lot to do with it, but I don't think it was limited to that. Uh, um, I don't think he was, uh, he was thinking we've got to manufacture because we've got to prepare for a war in 20 years. Uh, I think he was thinking of our economic independence in a broader way than that. Thank you. Going back to um, Adam Smith, how much of an impact do you think it had that in, in the difference between him and Hamilton to the fact that Adams lived throughout his life in a monarchy? Uh, I... I don't know quite how to answer that question. I mean, the, the Adam Smith's patrons were that I'm familiar with were prime ministers, right? Were were Shelburne and uh, Pitt and so forth. Uh, the degree to which he talked with or or dealt with, you know, the actual monarch you know, I'm unaware of. Uh, but those uh, those noblemen, right, who, who are really an integral part of the monarchy, uh, because uh, the monarchy in Britain, to my understanding, and this is not something I've studied a great deal, do, you know, it's, it's a, um, it's not just one person. It's the Privy Council, it's a grouping of close, oligarchical families that work together. And, um, and yes, indeed, I think that, that their power in Britain had a lot to do with Adam Smith's views. Because Adam Smith, of course, you know, he wrote this enormous volumes of writing. And you can find almost anything in the volumes of writing. There are parts of it that, you know, you could say sound just like Hamilton, right? But when the bottom, line comes down to what what you're going to do right he says things like other countries should not you know uh have manufacturing uh, you know it should be our monopoly technically he was against slavery but shelbourne was you know when you read his writings but shelbourne was intimately involved in the spread of slavery so it's, uh, you know, he was a, he was a paid for uh, operative of a certain a class of people. So I, yes, indeed, I guess that says that it has a lot to do with him being in a monarchy. Thank you. Do you find it ironic that Thomas Jefferson was accusing Hamilton of being a British monarchist while opposing American manufacturers? Yes, I find it incredibly ironic <laughs> because in fact, Jefferson was calling for the United States to continue to be dependent upon Great Britain, even while, uh, even while uh, he was beating the drums to say that, uh, Hamilton was pro-British. Yes, indeed, I do think that it's quite ironic. And did he realize what he was doing? Well, I uh, probably, probably not, probably not, because I think he had very uh, 
he somehow thought that the idea of becoming a messy manufacturing nation was worse. Absolutely. Any more questions from the public? If you would like to participate with voice, feel free to raise your hand as well. There's another question here. We're in a Hamiltonian moment now with the need to reshore industries. What should we be doing now? Well, uh, it's beyond the scope of, for me to say what specifically we should be doing. Uh, we don't want to get political here particularly, but I think one thing we should be doing is more people should be reading and studying Alexander Hamilton. Uh, and I would love to have, uh, you know, more people read my book, for example, uh, and actually from which I think they could get a very good idea of what the, of what, I guess what you would say today, the takeaways are uh, for what our policies should be today. I mean, I, it's true, many people have been when I use this quote about how every nation should be self-sufficient, self-subsisting in, in the essentials, you know, people say, oh my gosh, you know, how, how do we not do that? And, you know, thinking of the middle of the pandemic, for example, and our reliance on foreign countries for the basic uh, healthcare needs, which we had at that time. Uh, so, but if people, had versed themselves in the ideas, uh, then then we're in a much better position. I don't think. I think our one of our problems is uh, that we have today is that people are don't have take the attention span, don't use the attention span to actually study in depth and that is something Alexander Hamilton excelled at and they, we're never going to be Alexander Hamilton's I'm not <laughs> saying that but uh, but he he studied uh, and all of our great in my view great leaders studied they read they they thought they debated they uh, argued they you know um, they looked behind the surface to see what should be done. And that's, uh, so I you know, would recommend, uh, I'm in a position right now at my age and so forth where what I recommend is education and uh, education. Uh, and if you haven't read my book, I, I would urgently, uh, request that you do so. And if you are willing to put a review on Amazon, even the better. Thank you. We have another question here. What do you think about the idea that Hamilton is considered to be the father of Wall Street? Uh -huh. Well, what I say to many people is, what I find ironic is the people who love Hamilton the most and hate him the most, both see him as the father of Wall Street both identify him with Wall Street. And when I talk Wall Street, I'm talking primarily Wall Street practices of the last 50 years, you know, no, well, actually a hundred years, uh, certainly back to JP Morgan. Um, but the, you know, who, by the way, you know, JP Morgan's a good, a good example because here is a man who was you know, who was extreme, was the head of Wall Street and extremely rich and, but he never built anything. What he did was he bought up other people, what other people built, <laughs> what the entrepreneurs built, you know, and very often consolidated and, and shut down all, a lot of them uh, and basically took the rent out of it, took the, the money out of it. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, I, I think both 
people, many people who like Hamilton, uh, look at him from strictly the financial side, and and so did the people who many of the people who hate him. Um, my belief is that he was a nation builder first and foremost. He was not a financier per se. He was out to build the nation when it was necessary. Uh, to he was you know he was financially uh, upright. You know he thought you should pay your debts. You know, but he was primarily he was looking at what would unify the nation what would build the nation what would make it independent and make it last and a financial system that would do that uh, and that meant that he hated speculation uh, it meant that he was a uh, uh, was committed to trying to promote, to direct credit to areas that would physically build up the country. Thank you. So, can I just add a little onto your to Nancy since I'm on the Finance Museum? Please do, uh, please do. <laughs> hi, Nancy. Hi. Um, hi. So, I agree. Yeah, totally about the whole nation thinking as a whole, coming from where he came from. But narrowly to answer your question, Mark, when you think about the first five securities. That was that were traded on Wall Street. Uh, there are the threes, the sixes, and the deferred bonds. Hamilton's creation. There's the Bank of the United States uh, stock, Hamilton creation, and the Bank of New York stock, which then is again a Hamilton, you know, inspired. He wrote he wrote the charter, the first IPO ever. Hamilton was the Bank of the United States. So he creates the debt. He creates the dollar as the standard unit of measure. Um, he creates the central bank. He promotes all of these different banking systems and corporate way of life. So, well, I totally agree. It's all about the whole nation. To your narrower question, Father of Wall Street, I am wholeheartedly endorsing. Thank you so much, David, for, for explaining that. Uh, we have another question here. Uh, Nancy, could you please uh, talk a little bit about Hamilton's views on tariffs? Do you think that tariffs are still relevant policy for today? I really don't want to get into today questions. Um, Hamilton uh, believed that uh, tariffs were not his number one uh, most desirable uh, measure. He thought bounties, he thought subsidies were, be were better because they didn't increase the price of what was uh, uh, of the commodity. That you were dealing with, but it all depended upon what we, you know, this, the, the, uh, what we were, the product. It all depended upon whether how many we were producing, whether it was sufficient for what was required. It, it very much was a, a practical issue uh, on his part. Uh, he raised that uh, tariff on iron to ten uh, percent, you know, compared to what happened in the 1820s and what happened under Lincoln, that's like nothing. But, uh, but he did see it both as, as I said, both as uh, protecting what would be required to protect our domestic industry and as a revenue source. The, um, I mean, Jefferson much more took it even lower to be just a revenue source. As opposed to the as opposed to the protection, um, so there's something else I was going to say about it. Oh, his belief also of in tariffs was, although this has not totally been, uh, uh, well, it's been differentially carried out. Uh, is that yes, tariffs would raise, and he addressed specifically. What people said in the, in the, the build up to the Civil War, he said, you know, people will say, you know, your tariff is just helping the northern manufacturers. It's it's destroying us here as agricultural people. Uh, and he said, well, you know, this number one, he he rejected that entirely. He said, building the wealth of the nation is good for the nation as a whole, right? But he also said. 
definitively, he said that uh, while tariffs may raise the price of a product in the short term, ultimately they will lower the price. That is, he said that is true, you know, in everything he's studied. I mean, now the one place you can see it these days is, you know, menu is computers, right? Everything was much more expensive and became cheaper and cheaper with technological advance. There are other things where it doesn't seem to get cheaper, but those are basically a question of rent, I believe. Uh, rent, you know, housing, uh, bonded roads, you know, things like that, where everything goes up, up, up. But even though the price of production should be going down because of technological advance. But what he was saying is that, uh, that he was definitive that if uh, tariffs were used to protect industry, um, they would ultimately, uh, they might pay, you may pay a little bit more at the beginning, but then they would go down. Leonard had something to say. Yes. Um, why did so many Hamilton scholars, other than Dick Sila, claim that Hamilton claim that Hamilton was never able to get Congress to pass any of his proposals in the report of manufacturers when, as you quoted tonight, Congress passed all of his tariff proposals in just five months? Why? Well, they don't really pay much attention to the report on manufacturers. I mean, that's, to me, that's the, the problem is, is that people tend to look at economics now as a, and worse now than ever before, as a financial thing, not as a physical, uh, the organizing of a physical economy of what we need to eat, what we need to wear, what we need to live in and so forth. They, they think about the money bottom line uh, as opposed to the organizing of, of the necessities of life and the progress of those, of those necessities. And, and therefore, uh, and so they, I think they're just very superficial. They say, well, they never passed the whole big thing. They never discussed it. So they don't go into the detail. They don't look at the fact of what exactly Hamilton proposed for iron or what he, exactly he proposed for skins or what exactly he proposed for books. For example, he, he wanted to have a tariff on imported books. Uh, so that is uh, something that, um, so they're ignorant, I believe, in many respects. People don't read it. People do not read it uh, because it is dense and it is thorough and, um, and they're distracted by other things. Thank you. We are entering our last questions of the night, but Adam Levinson has a very brief comment about Hamilton printers and Matthew Carey. Um, Adam? Sure, so just on a lighter note, because you you mentioned Matthew Carey, the printer, and I wanted to make the observation that uh, in, in a way, uh, Hamilton had a special relationship with printers because, uh, you know, Ma and Matthew Carey and Isaiah Thomas, and some of these printers become very successful businessmen with vertically integrated businesses. Uh, so I think the point is that uh, people loved Hamilton and uh, the printing and the written word uh, and Hamilton connected back then. And it doesn't surprise me that the people who are on today are readers and writers. So there's something about Hamilton and education, Nancy, which, uh, which, which, fit, which fits together. Uh, so it was a pleasure listening to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Yeah. Uh, lastly, um, can you elaborate on the words of Henry Clay uh, not that uh, without the protection of manufacturers, uh, a British commercial control would eventually lead to recolonization of the states? If I recall that correctly, please correct. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much what he said. Pretty much what he said. Uh, Actually, his Henry Carey was saying even later that we were still a British colony <laughs> because of our lack of protection. Uh, 
for our manufactured base. Um, so the, I mean, he was, he was looking at the financial purse strings, particularly in the period after the uh, destruction of the Second Bank of the United States. Uh, because as uh, Ray Hammond says in his voluminous writing about it, you know, the, about the financial system of the United States, he says that uh, power shifted not to all the little banks around the country, they, it shifted to the big banks in New York. Um, and therefore there was more control uh, and they were very into, very closely integrated, many of them with, with London. So he's looking at that, he's looking at how, uh, at the British role in financing uh, the slave expansion uh, and the slave trade. After all, 80% of the cotton was going to England. Uh, and, uh, and he's looking at the effective trade war that the British were carrying out against the United States because they were not reconciled until the Civil War, in my view, to the United States becoming a manufacturing nation. They were willing to dump uh, cheap goods here in order to uh, destroy the uh, possibility of us becoming a manufacturing giant. And Hamilton understood that at the beginning. All these people I've discussed who followed him understood it extremely well. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we had numerous politicians who for various reasons either did not understand it <laughs> or uh, deliberately uh, went against the interests of their country uh, in order to, uh, to suppress the measures that were necessary. Thank you. I know I said that was the last question, but there is a very interesting question here. So um, it was interesting to hear about translations of Hamilton's report of manufacturers in other languages. And uh, Mariana Oller is asking if you have come across any evidence that other nations try to adopt some of Hamilton's ideas. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That's exactly what, what the Japanese thought they were doing. Uh, with the Meiji Restoration, in setting up the National Bank, they were looking at Hamilton. The Australians in the beginning of the 20th century, you know, expi explicitly said, you know, Hamilton is the hero. We're doing Hamilton's bank. Uh, the uh, in Germany and Russia. There was less specific Hamilton, more American system in general. Uh, as I said, Vita, who's the father of the Trans-Siberian Railroad, uh, not the Transatlantic, uh, was a, uh, I mean, there's a long history. I suggest you go to my blog, americansystemnow.com, has a lot on the uh, Russian, in the influence of American system thinking in Russia, uh, because from John Quincy Adams forward, there was incredibly uh, deep influence in the intelligentsia, in the intelligentsia. Uh, and what I find very interesting is that these people are latching on to him. You know, think about Hamilton. What was he most upset about politically? Sort of was the decentralization, right? that every state, that states would have more power than the federal government, that they would be clashing with each other, then then we would be divided and destroyed, right? He wanted national unity and, and was wanted to cut the states down to size. Some people say he literally wanted to cut the states down to size. So, and these uh, other countries, you know, hardly call them democratic, but take it for what it's worth, we're faced with huge, feudal oligarchies who were saying, we don't want, you know, transportation 
infrastructure. We don't want, you know, we want effectively like the Southern plantation owners, except with a different system, right? Uh, so, you know, Japan had that kind of, uh, uh, say, trapeze. They had that in, uh, uh, in Germany. And uh, interestingly enough, one of Hamilton's acknowledged heroes cited in the uh, Continentalist papers was uh, Jean-Baptiste Colbert from France, whose precise job for Louis XIV was to break down the power of the feudal uh, lords and create a nation state. Uh, so um, I, yes, indeed, I think very much the, uh, not always Hamilton by name, but, um, but very much influenced by Hamilton's ideas of how to have a unified nation using government credit to build the physical growth and productivity of labor. Thank you so much, Nancy. I wanted to piggyback on Mariana's uh, question with, with a different angle to it as well. Uh, when you look at the process of independence from South America, something that is really interesting is that they already had the blueprint of the American Revolution to follow. However, they deemed the uh, financial system that was being consolidated here as extremely liberal. And while they followed a lot of things of the blueprint of the American Revolution, they completely rejected uh, and did not follow any of the um, financial economical uh, measures that Hamilton had been putting in place and look what would happen later on. Instead of having a superpower, um, it, it did not achieve the, the, the economical greatness um, that, you know, place like the United States that follow that uh, financial system enjoys. Mm -hmm. I think they, I think that some, there were, I think I've indicated to you before that my, I have friends from South America who, who followed the influence of Hamilton in that area, but um, in various countries, particularly at the end of the 19th century in Brazil, uh, um, but they were defeated. <laughs> um, and uh, they, and, and fairly brutally. So that uh, did contribute to the result that you're saying. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Also, thank you so much, David Cowan, for um, your contributions to tonight's discussion. Uh, we look forward to having you again, uh, Nancy, in a, in a future Zoom event. And I want to thank everybody in the chat for for the questions and, and comments, and um, we will see each other very soon. This uh, event has been recorded and will be shared in our online platforms in a few days from today. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you.